Um, welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our um, uh, uh, the, the, this legacy lecture, um, which is named in honor of Dr. Bob Brittell. Dr. Brittell was, a, was one of the anchors of the Department of Medicine for, for uh, several decades. He was a general internist um, uh, at a time when there were not that many general internists on the faculty. Um, he had a number of titles over the years, but the one he was proudest of was that of teacher. Um, Dr. Brutel was known oh. as and mentees for that over the years. Founding the academic division of general internal medicine, um, both in establishing it and in recruiting um, its first chairman. And um, he was also appointed with the task of creating the Department of Family Medicine. So that was originally a division within the Department of Medicine. Um, he was the original chair and then recruited his replacement. And our outstanding Department of Family Medicine here at University of Colorado um, owes a debt to Dr. Bertel. Um, but many of us who, um, uh, who were pleased and, and, and fortunate to know Dr. Bertel um, carry his legacy with us today. And we are delighted to have our guest speaker today um, to speak in his honor. Thank you, Mark. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm going to uh, have the pleasure of introducing the speaker, Kelly Skeff. Kelly is currently the De uh, George DeForest Barnett Professor of Medicine at Stanford, and he's the co-director of the Stanford Faculty Development Center for Medical Teachers. Uh, Kelly was the Internal Medicine Residency Program Director at Stanford for 20 years. Uh, he did his undergraduate and MD degree at the University of Colorado, graduating magna cum laude, did his internship at Harbor General in uh, Los Angeles. Residency was done at, the, at Colorado and Stanford. He did a fellowship in general internal medicine at Stanford and got a PhD in education uh, at Stanford. His uh, area of research focus for his career has been on improving teaching effectiveness on wellness and burnout. Uh, Kelly was a, a year ahead of me at the University of Colorado, and I've known him uh, uh, casually for uh, many years. He actually was a clinician educator before that academic track was identified. I think he was one of the, if not the first clinician educator in the country. Uh, he wrote uh, on the benefits of work hour restrictions relative to wellness and burnout in a paper that was published 20 years ago, uh, well ahead of his, uh, of his time. He's won numerous teaching awards, um, has had funding for his research from the RWJ Foundation, from the Macy Foundation, from the Hartford Foundation. He's uh, been on the editorial boards for Academic Medicine, the American Journal of Medicine, the Journal of Hospital Medicine, and he's got uh, numerous invited lectures in the U.S. and in the all, all over the world. Uh, he's uh, perhaps the most well-known uh, 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 speaker on uh, medical education in the country. So, Kelly, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. We look forward to your talk. Rick, thank you so much. Uh, and can you hear me? Is everything okay in terms of yes? Sound? Okay, we're good. Very good. Well, as all of you know, it is a tremendous honor to be invited home to talk at all. And when people have you back, you feel very grateful to that. But it's a special honor. And I don't know if any of the Bertel family is on with us today, but I want to thank them personally <coughs> because Dr. Bertel was a wonderful uh, person and mentor. Uh, he was an icon during the time that I was a medical student, and even back when I came back as a resident, uh, because of his caring. And I think you can see in his picture uh, the, the love and the caring and the joy that he had as he took care of others and affected the entire state of Colorado. Uh, I'm from a small town in Colorado, and I think uh, Dr. Bertel and Dr. Silver and others in that era uh, had tremendous impact on the health care of many people in Colorado. So uh, to the family, if you're here, uh, I thank you very much for uh, loaning him to the field of medicine 
because he had a tremendous impact, not only at the time he was there, uh, but at, at the time now. So I'm going to have to disregard that phone if you'll just uh, ignore it for the moment. Uh, I've titled this on my return, uh, Educational Theories, Insights into Medical Education. And uh, I had the luxury, I had the wonderful opportunity of being able to get a PhD in education when I went to Stanford. Uh, when I was at Stanford, uh, I had some wonderful things happen to me. I had some mentors who watched me work. And the mentors in my fellowship watched me work and said, you know, you're really interested in teaching, uh, but you really ought to learn about it, which I found is a, a kind of a, a powerful statement for a mentor to make to a student who thinks he already knows the field. Because as you know, so many of us are exposed to teaching and exposed to education, and we've had so much experience, we do believe that we in fact know the field. And so, they encouraged me to walk over to the Stanford School of Education and get to meet the people there. And suddenly I was introduced to this group of scholars who were studying how people learn, who were studying this insight into the psychology and the communication aspects of education. And it was a real treat for me because I found out that one, I had underestimated the power of that entire field that was studying in depth what was going on. And many of the people that I met at this education school were people whose theories were being used in medicine and we didn't even know it. Uh, so what I thought I would do today is share with you some of the insights that I got out of medical education and medical theories and talk about how those apply to us in medicine. As you know, I have no disclosures. Um, the honor to talk to people like you who are teaching in medicine is great. And I wanted to go through a few definitions that I think will kind of highlight for you why I feel this way. Because I get to talk to you about us. Now, Grand Rounds is usually about a patient. Now, this Grand Rounds is about us as teachers and as physicians. Now, I'm going to touch on a few patients during the Grand Rounds, but really, we are the subject of this Grand Rounds. And why do I do this? Why am I having the opportunity? Why am I so compelled to talk to you? And here are the goals, because I think there are those of us who are stewards of our profession. I think we have to become more effective advocates of all the healthcare workers that we have, that we haven't been adequate advocates for ourselves. And I wanna help us identify opportunities to help ourselves become more effective as physicians, as teachers and learners, and as physician teachers. Now, who are we talking about when we talk about teachers? Well, who are teachers? A human being who assists others to acquire knowledge, skills, and attitudes to enable them to lead a fulfilled and gratifying life. That's the definition of a teacher. A teacher is one of the most valuable worlds, professions that anybody could join because their world is totally committed to help other people. And how about us, physicians? One human being with the knowledge, skills, or values to enable others to lead a healthy, fulfilled, and gratifying life. That's us as physicians. And then there's another group. Physician teachers. I call this group the holders of the domino effect. Why? Because physician teachers, teachers of physician, are human beings who assist others in the acquisition of knowledge, skills, or values to enable others to lead a healthy and fulfilled and gratifying life. So when you and I teach as a physician, the dominoes go immediately to the people, but those people whom we touch, touch. And so we have to think very seriously about the power and the utility of this incredible responsibility that we take. I'm gonna draw upon three things to talk about today. Educational theories, uh, data on our profession, and opportunities that I think those two things 
bring to us as physician teachers. Educational theories. Well, the theories that I'm gonna to touch on uh, really had their birth in the 1950s at the University of Chicago, where an educator by the name of Benjamin Bloom brought together major educators in the United States to try to develop a taxonomy of what the field of education was. And Bloom's taxonomy ended up dividing education into the acquisition of three things, a knowledge, those cognitive skill, things that we use, the not cognitive processing, skills, the procedural skills that we use, and the values and attitudes that we acquire. And Bloom brought these folks together to say that teachers are affecting all three of these, and that you and I as teachers must recognize that they live together as well as alone. When we affect people's knowledge, we're often affecting their attitudes. And when we affect their attitudes, they're often affecting knowledge. But they began to, bribe, to, pr to prompt the research in education to subdivide these categories and to focus on them. So what I'm going to do for you today is talk about some of my favorite theories having to do with knowledge acquisition, skills acquisition, and attitude acquisition. And then talk about how those might relate to some of the cases that we see in medicine and relate to our lives. Now, here are the theories that I'm gonna to touch on and I'll go through them one at a time and go with you. First about knowledge, about skills and about attitudes. Knowledge acquisition. I'm gonna draw upon the work of a man named David Kolb who studied experiential learning. Now the David Kolb drew this diagram it was the PDSA cycle long before the PDSA cycles were written about. And what this said is that you and I as a human being begin our life or during our life, we have concrete experiences. And then we take time and reflect on those experiences, thinking about them, seeing what happened to us. And we move from the reflection to abstract conceptualization. We think about what we went through and what it meant, and then we take the abstract conceptualization and move it into active experimentation in our next, uh, our next activity in our life. So this is a four part series of learning. All steps in this part are important. Now, I commonly, and I wish I could see all of you who are online today, but I can't. I commonly ask people to ask themselves the question, as you think about your current life, is any one of these steps taking precedence over the others? As you think about what you do from day to day, when I ask medical residents this question, what they often tell me is that they're spending time having repeated concrete experiences. And the busier they've gotten and the more complex the field of medicine has become, the concrete experiences continue with inadequate time to have reflective observation. Inadequate time to think about the cases that they're in. Inadequate time to abstract and decide what's going to happen next. One student who was on the ward with me said, as we began to talk about a patient we came out of the room with, she said, Dr. Skeff, what an interesting change this is. I said, why? She said, because we usually talk about discharge planning. Discharge planning, a repeated concrete experience that may or may not have reflection about that patient that we just helped. So I thought I would give you a case to think about for reflection that I thought would be fun about a case for experiential learning. And so I'm so sorry I can't have you talking to each other and that I can't see you. So you're gonna to have to talk to yourself, which is sometimes fun, but not usually is when I talk to myself, it gets problematical. But I want you to talk to yourself about this case. This is a patient that we saw in the clinic at Stanford. I was with a resident, 39 year old man, Spanish speaking only, with an unprovoked deep venous thrombophobitis. And he had already had a pulmonary embolus and was on anticoagulation. And there was a question about whether he was having another pulmonary embolus, whether he had inadequate treatment. There was a question about whether this chest pain that he was concerned about really made us think about new things. So he came to the clinic and that was our history, that this 38 year old patient had unprovoked deep venous thrombophobitis 
than a questionable pulmonary embolism. So the resident presented this case to me in the room outside, and we talked about what do we need to think about? What do we think about? How long he's been on anticoagulation? Does the new, does the new symptom of more chest pain worry us again? Are we going to have to have a new scan? Are we going to have to have an angiogram? What are we going to have to do to prove, to figure out what it was about this patient and the issue of, and I want to focus on this, the pulmonary ambulance. Now, some of you who may have heard me talk nationally may know about this case. So if you do, well, you can't talk to each other now anyhow, so I'm okay. The point is, is that we went in to see this patient. And when we went in to see the patient, it turned out that there were two other people in the room with this patient, a lady, older lady, and a, a young man about the same age. And so I asked, well, who are these folks in the room? Because that wasn't presented to me by the resident. Uh, the older lady was his mother, who was so worried about her son that she came with him to the clinic. And I asked her if she could give us any clues about anything that he had had before in his life that might tell us what was happening here. And she said, no, absolutely not. And the other, the man in the room was working on his cell phone, like many do. And I said to him, with the help of the Spanish translator, well, who are you? And he looked up at me and he said, well, I am his Uber driver. Well, that's the whole case. And so I want you to reflect on this for a while and ask yourself, what does this patient have? What's going on here in this case? And I wish I could listen to some of you talk, but I wonder if you think about this case, uh, what might this patient have, this person with this unprovoked DVT and a pulmonary embolism? Now, Mark, I hope you don't mind me calling on you a little more than the average time. But because you represent so many general internists who are being faced with this, uh, any thoughts about this patient or what I've told you that you might wonder about? Uh, plenty. Um, I'm trying to connect the dot between an Uber driver being present and, um, of course, wondering if he's more than just an Uber driver, if there's some other relationship there. Um, uh, <clears throat> I, um, and I'm not coming up with much. Okay. Well, Rick, um, can you help on this? Any, any thoughts, Rick? To unmute here. <clears throat> well, I, uh, the first thing Mark said was what I was thinking about is uh, an Uber, Uber driver doesn't accompany the patient into a room. Yeah. Uh, so there is more than what it, uh, you're revealing to us. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's some type of relationship between uh, th this guy and, and the driver. Yeah. Um, uh, Can you keep going? If the person that? is on anticoagulation, the first thing I would wonder about is what is this other than a pulmonary embolism? Uh -huh. Are we dealing with cardiac chest pain, esophageal chest pain, uh -huh. pneumonia chest pain? Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Pulmonary embolus is not really very high on the list yeah. if, he's, if he's therapeutically anticoagulated. Yeah. So you've uh, touched on, both of you touched on some wonderful things. The, the puzzle over this driver, which we didn't puzzle about at all, by the way. <coughs> We didn't puzzle about this driver. Uh, we focused on the issues of the chest pain and the pulmonary embolus. It was only eight hours left after clinic when suddenly I began to puzzle about this driver. And Rick, you started to say, I wonder who this driver is. You want to you want to take that any further? What do you, who, do you, who is this driver? Well, it could be a relative, could be a partner, yeah. could be a... Uh, um... Uh, it, it's not just a driver. Yeah, and if he's a partner, what would it make you think of? Well, we have to worry about um, HIV-related issues. Yeah. Well, pretty interesting here is that suddenly with the reflection that we've just had, we've enabled ourselves to come up with, like, we have to worry about HIV and other issues. And so we might ask ourselves, gee, HIV, 
is HIV related to DBT? And so I called the resident that night and I said, you know, Lisa, we missed the diagnosis today. The patient has HIV. And she said, well, HIV, is that related to DBT? And so I said, well, let's open up your <clears throat> computer and put those two terms in the search engine. And this is our screen at Stanford at the moment. We put in HIV and DBT and guess what? Lo and behold, HIV is a predisposer to DBT. Now, the reason it hit me over the head is because I had missed the case 20 years before of a young patient with HIV and DVT and a pulmonary embolus, and we were all working up his chest pain. But his predisposition to HIV, but to DVT was from HIV. But I didn't know that, you see? And it takes reflection about the case to say, well, what is this Uber driver doing there to make think about HIV? And then it takes the opportunity to go and look at this, uh, look intersect those two terms in which we then were working with PubMed. And I would highlight for you that PubMed previously to about a year ago would anchor their uh, search in terms of chronology. And because of some work that we had done and our discussions with them, they moved to a new search called Best Match. So now the most likely PubMed search that you'll get is not on the basis of chronology of the most recent article, but on the one that best matches your search terms. So I'm kind of advertising PubMed for you a little bit because they actually responded to us. And here is the resident who did her poster session on the differential diagnosis for unprovoked DVT. Do not forget HIV. Now you and I, if we hadn't seen a case like this before, if we don't contemplate it, if we don't take the time to think, if we don't take the time to reflect and talk and only do what we've done before, we won't think about these things. And so patients may get totally deprived by what's happening to us as we move through cases so fast that reflection is not a part of what we do. So I wanna highlight that David Cole pointed out that if you're gonna learn, you don't just keep having repeated concrete experiences. You have to have time for reflection and thinking about what puzzled you as you move into new abstraction and new active experimentation. So I wanna worry us a little bit because I think that many people in medicine have gone to concrete experiences repetition and that our opportunities to reflect, our opportunities to talk about our cases are not as often as they were before. And I'll talk more about that. So another area that I wanna think with you about is a cognitive area of cognitive load. And, and my sweller focused on this <clears throat> only in the last uh, three decades, but he about 1990. Sweller focuses on what you and I have to do as a human being as we deal with the information that's presented to us. And he focuses on cognitive load and, and he broke them down into three things. Intrinsic load, that's the material, the thoughts that you have, the information that you get given that's essential for you to perform your task. He talked about germane load, which is focused on the deliberate use of cognitive strategies that help learning, germane and learning. And extraneous load, that's when we hear a whole bunch of things that don't have anything to do with whether we learn or whether we get the task done. Very important area. So I thought, well, and he also pointed out that to address cognitive load, fields develop sophisticated structures that permit us to perceive and think and solve problems. Things like the review of systems, structures that make us think about how to look at break things down and think about them. So I, for cognitive load theory, I thought I would share with you that uh, an experience of imagine you're on night call with you have patient coverage and you get called to see a patient. And what I wanna share with you is the, uh, the electronic medical record note that you open up when you get called to see this patient. And so I hope that all of you can see your screen because I'm gonna give you the note and give you some time to read it, to imagine you're the doctor who's called to see this patient. So here you go.
Okay. Well, I'm responsible for making that screen go black. Okay. You can still hear me, correct? Yeah, okay. So I made that screen go black. And I want to make sure that everybody here knows how to do that. Is that when you're in a PowerPoint slideshow mode, if you hit the B key on your screen, it'll on your keyboard, it'll go black. That's probably worth the price of admission today for those of you that teach. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I hit the B create screen and made it go black because I wanted to stop your reading. And I wonder if you could share for me just a moment. What emotional feeling did you have during the time that you were reading that case? And Mark and Rick, are you are the surrogates for this whole group today? And so, Mark, could you tell me how you were feeling when I made the screen go black? Uh, anxious. I um, or or perhaps um, inadequate. I assumed that that was enough time for me to get through it, and I didn't get through it. Yeah. Well, it wasn't enough time for you to get through it, but it was the time that you would take if you had there and you're anxious. Yeah. And Rick, what were you feeling when you were reading that? I didn't get through it and was upset that you that the screen went black. <laughs> I'm a I'm a slow reader and I was thinking about what I was reading and I got about halfway through and said, wait right. a minute, I need more information here. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So this is a frustrating moment at the time you're reading it and I would tell you that some of us as we're reading these notes that we can get all the way through it and still be anxious and frustrated, okay? And so what I wanna highlight for you as I come back to that screen, that you could take the same information and here's another note for you. Now, how'd you feel, Mark? Um, uh, uh, several uh, degrees calmer than in the last one. Yeah, yeah. So what are we talking about here? This has the same information of the prior note, except for one thing. We've taken all things having to do with time and age and chronology and moved them to the left. And we've taken the patient history and the evolution of that history and put it on the right. So that you and I can listen and think about how a patient is evolving and know the timeline and know what the symptoms are that are going on. So I've been teaching this for 40 years, that if the note were written in a way that you could make sense of it, that we would make more diagnoses, that in fact, we would come up with conclusions, that we could see the changes in the patient evolution and not have to scramble through this note. Because in this note, we don't see as much intrinsic and germane load. We see what seems to be extraneous load as our mind is going every which direction. And so one of the Stanford medical students said to me, well, Dr. Skeff, you better put a name on this. So we call this the chronology of present illness. Not the history of present illness, the chronology of present illness. Well, all physical diagnosis texts talk about the importance of chronology. But why don't we write it chronologically? Why do we write these paragraphs? Well, we did a study at Stanford where one of the surgical residents said, we've got to study this. And so we did a study in which we gave the night float residents who were on call. We, they were on call for two weeks. For the first week, we had them write their note in the paragraph fashion that they had been taught. And for the second week, we had them use the chronology of present illness, where they wrote all the notes in a chronological fashion. What originally had happened to the patient before the symptoms began and what happened when the symptoms began and how the symptoms evolved. And we had them rate the clarity of the sign up, the clarity of the written note, the clarity of their assessment and plan, the quality. And even the day team residents who took over the patient all had this step up in clarity and ability. And the person who helped us write that article was a resident whose note I read and couldn't figure out, why did I know that she needed help with this like I do? 
is because her other day float residents were trying to present her case to me that they hadn't worked up. And they couldn't do it from this kind of note. But they could do it from this kind of note. So we named it the chronology of present illness and we studied it. And in fact, the people who used it got clearer and improved their quality. And I want to let kind of bring this home uh, by showing you about an interview we had with the residents afterwards. We said, what would keep you from using the CPI? And let's see what that resident said. I see if you can read this. Why would a medical student not use the CPI? Because they have to write a beautiful paragraph and the longer it is, the more rewards they get, okay? Well, how were you taught to write your history? I wanna call attention to the last part of this sentence. And then you talk about everything that happens and you try to convince the reader of the diagnosis you wanna to get to. But do we actually teach people that? The answer, yes. We tell people, write your history. If, if I hear your history correctly, I should get a good idea what your assessment plan is gonna be. A real good idea. Well, what does that do to the person writing the history? Subliminally, what if one of the patient's symptoms doesn't match your, your uh, diagnosis? You leave it out of the HPI. Because we would hate to have an attending tell us, gee, uh, that, that's irrelevant. Because most of us say, put in the HPI what's relevant. Well, who would have known that the Uber driver was relevant? Who would have known that some things that you and I consider irrelevant would be relevant if we start screening and filtering what we put in the history? And nowadays, when people are looking at histories like this, What's happening in the electronic medical record is the reader is automatically going to the assessment and plan and jumping from the history to see what the other person thought. So I'm trying to make a case for you that it's very useful to use this chronology and don't try to convince the reader totally because when we walk, look at each other's patients, we hope that the new reader has some new ideas. So to make this case, I wanna tell you about another patient. Here was another patient that came to the general medicine clinic at Stanford, a 69-year-old woman with Parkinson's disease, again, unprovoked deep venous thrombophobitis. And the neurosurgeon wanted to know what to do with her anticoagulation. When should they stop it before the neurosurgery? When should they restart it? There was an anticoagulation question. And so we spent time outside, the resident and I, what did we know about it? When we needed a hematologist? We talked about anticoagulation. And then we went in to see the lady, the patient. And I said to her, we're really sorry that you're having this. Can you tell us when this started? She said, you mean my knee or the thrombophobitis? And I said, take me to the very beginning. <coughs> well, she said, you know, I have Parkinson's disease and I fell down in my house and I twisted my knee and my knee swelled up. And then a week after my knee swelled up, my calf swelled up. And then I went to the emergency room and they did a, an echo. She was a very bright lady and they diagnosed thrombophobitis. And I've been on my coagulation ever since. Well, this is six months ago, six months ago. Now, is this unprovoked DVT? Not at all. Post-traumatic DVT. And the trauma is over and the knee is normal. So it wasn't how long we should do anticoagulation before and after surgery is whether she should be on it now at all this long. And why did we make this diagnosis is because we're making diagnoses on gestalt. How does the patient look when we see them that moment without the history of how they got there and how were their symptoms prior to the time that the illness presented? The illness that we're seeing now what were the predisposing characteristics? So I wanna just make the case and try, try to suggest to you that we could help ourselves in cognitive load if we help use a chronology of present illness, relating patient symptoms to time, and that you and I would not separate 
the symptoms from the time and we would not leave out of our write-up symptoms that we don't understand. And we might be able to avoid diagnostic errors. Well, I wanna move now to skills training. Anders Ericsson is an expert in the area of acquiring new skills. He studied piano players, uh, surgeons, chess players, all sorts of folks. And he knows probably more than anybody else about practice and skills training. And he developed something called deliberate practice. It's how you and I acquire a skill. And he said there are components to deliberate practice. It has a task with a well-defined goal, a motivation of the learner to improve, an observer who can give you immediate feedback, opportunities for repetition, and gradual refinements and lifting up of your performance to a new level. So I said, well, I began to study Anders Ericsson and go on rounds. I asked myself, well, what am I watching on rounds? So there's a couple of scenes that I was seeing on rounds that some of you might have seen. Here's one. There happened to be a Saturday when I'm on call with the resident alone without her interns, et cetera. And I'm watching her work with the computer. Here's her list of patients on here. Here's her gear. Here's her beeper. Here's her phone. She's multitasking like crazy. And I'm asking myself, gee, what is the skill I'm going to help her with? So I began to ask myself, well, let's see, what is she doing about learning? Well, what else do we see when we watch our residents? Well, here's the fellows in the GI clinic at Stanford. So you and I as an attending who are watching people use these computers might ask ourselves, well, what's the other skill that they might use that could help them move to a new level? So to bring this home, I wanna give you another case to have you think about. This is a real fun case, one close to my heart. A uh, patient calls in on the weekend, 82 year old woman calling in on the weekend for advice about her feet. She has problem with her feet. She woke up that morning with a numbness of her feet and pain when she, stand up, when she would stand up and walk. Numbness of her feet and pain when she would stand up and walk on, on her feet. Clearly a stalking kind of symptom. And I said to her, well, what's happened to you in the past? The doctor talking to her. Well, about a month ago, I had a flu-like syndrome. And I had to go see my doctor and for this, and I've had the flu-like syndrome, and now I have this feet thing, okay? But what might you and I think about in a case like this? A month ago, a flu-like syndrome, and now your feet are hurting you and pain as well as numbness. Well, just this could be something as, as, as unusual as Ascending paralysis. This could be something. This could be Guillain-Barré syndrome. I have to be worried about something like that. But I said, no, no we, let's just do a chronology of present illness. Okay, so a month ago, you had a flu-like syndrome. And what happened after that? Well, I went to see my doctor. And I saw my doctor uh, approximately a week and a half ago. And when he examined me and did laboratory tests, he thought I had a urinary tract infection. And he started me on an antibiotic and I've taken that antibiotic. And I went back to see him earlier this week and I still had cells in my urine. So he told me to take another round of the antibiotic and that's what I've done. I've started the antibiotic again. And now I end up with my feet like this. Well, what other question do we have to ask? What's the antibiotic? Wonder if anybody has any thought about what's the antibiotic. Mark, any guess on this one? Uh, is it a uh, fluoroquinolone? Well, that's what most would guess, most would guess. But she said, no, it's nitrofurantoin, macrobed. Oh, really, macrobed. I've given a lot of macrobed out in my day, right? Many of, many of us have given out macrobed. So we go back to our search engine and we put up in here, Macrobed. Well, I actually, I wish I would have each of you on your cell phone put in Macrobed and peripheral neuropathy. If any of you have a capability of doing that with your cell phone now, uh, do your search and please put in, or your computer, Macrobed and peripheral neuropathy and tell me what you see. The residents are all there. I know you've got your phones with you. Uh, please put in Macrobed 
peripheral neuropathy. Tell me if you get anything. Did you get a hit? Does it have anything? There are several. It's a, uh, it looks like you could go through pages of uh, references. Yeah, interesting. Pages of references on macrobed and peripheral neuropathy. It turns out that macrobed causes an irreversible peripheral nitroferantoin induced neuropathy. Irreversible if you keep giving it. You're supposed to take the patient off of it. She wants to know if she's supposed to continue her medication on the second round. Absolutely not. She still has peripheral neuropathy even though she got the macrobid stop. Now, how long do you have to practice before you see a macrobid induced peripheral neuropathy? Probably on this How long have call. you been practicing? Huh? <laughs> how long <laughs> well, have you been like, practicing? Right, a long time. So you think you can imagine you and I, each of us practice 20 to 40 years. There's 50 of us on a call. You got to practice for a thousand years before you see one of these. Usually in an audience, when I present this case, there's one person who's seen it. We are not going to practice for a thousand years, but what it says to us is that it's very important to say, are we using the skill of a patient where we have two components that the patient has, a peripheral neuropathy and a drug? Because you know, when a patient goes to another doctor, the differential diagnosis expands. It never gets shorter, it gets expands because you and I treat. And when we treat, we end up adding another variable to the diagnosis. But you see, if we don't look up HIV and peripheral neuropathy, if we don't look up nitroferantoin or macrobid and peripheral neuropathy, we're just likely to give that patient more drug. So what's the case I wanna make here? Is that it's very useful to think about whether we're using our new skills, our newly found skills of this computer with all the magic inside of it, to intersect, and I ask my resident to take the moment and intersect two of the diagnoses that the patient has, or one of the drugs and a diagnosis, and see what you get. You cannot walk away from the computer without learning in 60 to 120 seconds. And on rounds, I'll say, I'm gonna give you 60 seconds to do this. You connect two of the things that the patient has that you don't think are related, and the intern connects two that they do think are related, and guaranteed everybody will learn. So I wanna encourage you and the fun of this. I mean, this is an internist heyday, but why don't we do it? Often because of time, we're writing the note. Why don't we do it? Because of time. Peripheral toxic effects of nitroferantoin, fluoroquinolone, so there you are, Mark, with your ne peripheral neuropathy. And anyhow, the point is, is that there's a way to know what you don't know if you're listening to what you don't know. Are you asking these questions? Are we watching our trainees? Do we have time to watch them? Even on rounds before COVID, what I was saying was not what I saw when I trained in Colorado, where the interns rounded together. A splitting of the teams. Everybody scatter and get as much work as you can do and then come back and we'll talk. Are we helping? watch them to learn. And then finally, I wanna leave with you attitudes and values and how we might use the educational theories on attitude and value acquisition and ask ourselves, are we doing enough of this? Are we actually helping people acquire and manifest the attitude that they wrote eloquently about in their application to medical school? And two writers are really wonderful to read in this case. One is Daniel Pink and the other is Simon Sinek. They've both written wonderful books and are on YouTube. You can, I recommend you watch them on YouTube, read their books, whatever. But Daniel Pink pointed out that the human being is motivated to learn with a desire for autonomy, a desire for mastery, and a desire for purpose. And he points out that research that takes two people two groups and has one group be reminded about their purpose after they've done a task. And another group 
get feedback on how they do the task. Which of the groups do you think performs the best on improving their performance on the task? The group that reminded themselves of purpose. Why are we doing this? What are we doing? Now, I just went to a talk at Stanford recently on the feedback that physicians get about their care, about the metrics of their care. Very few of those metrics talked about purpose. They compared that physician to every other physician. They compared that division to every other division. There was not happiness in the room of the comparison. Nobody said, oh God, the other division is better than us. I really want to contact them to see what they're doing. That's purpose. That's mastery. That's autonomy. They had fear and a sense of oppression as the feedback was not given for purpose. It was given for metrics. Feedback for metrics, often metrics related to how we're paid, whether the how we're paid is related to purpose or not. So I would say that in some cases, we are beginning to erode the value system, the value system that made us join this profession and move to a value system where we have learned in medicine, medical students learn intensely how to master what they're gonna be measured on. Residents learn how to master what they're gonna be measured on. And I hate to say it, but faculty and practicing physicians have learned how to master what they're gonna be measured on, even when the measurements do not fulfill the purpose for what you're doing. One emergency room resident, a faculty member said to me, I am so tired of having to give the patient a drug to get a great rating on the patient rating that patient rating have converted a physician who knows that giving an antibiotic for a viral syndrome is the wrong thing to do, he'll give it to him because the patient will give him a higher rating. Because he doesn't have time to do the explanation. Now, Simon Sinek highlights for the business world and for us as well, that most of the time that we're working, we're talking about what we're doing and how to do it faster and not why we're doing it. And Simon Sinek points out that if we start on, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Is it really fulfilling the values of our profession or not? Well, this began to worry me a lot. And why did it worry me? Why does it worry me? We have outcome mandates that said it should worry me and it should worry you. Why are, what are the outcome mandates? Diagnostic errors. People that are burning out are being shown to make more diagnostic errors. Diagnostic errors are related to how much time you have to think. Student suicide and resident depression. That data should scare us. Faculty and physician burnout. That data should scare us as well. What is that data? Well, what is the data on our profession? Here's some data from Medscape. 2013, burnout by specialty. Nobody's left out. Nobody is left out. Emergency medicine, OBGYN, family medicine, internal medicine, we're fourth. In 2013. It didn't get better in the light bars 2017. Here's 2020. And Tate Shanafeld at Stanford just gave a talk at Stanford about burnout at Stanford recently, 2021 with COVID, burnout got worse. But guess what? In some cases, fulfillment got better. Burnout got worse, fulfillment got better. Why would that be? Why would that be? There's been more purposefulness about physicians and nurses and healthcare providers in the COVID crisis than we've seen in the press. We thank the healthcare providers now. Purposefulness. Burnout worse, fulfillment better. Can you imagine that? But we don't want this kind of burnout. 
specialties that had the highest portion of burnout, critical care, emergency medicine, family medicine, internal. Okay, where you practice. Well, why is this happening to us? What do we know about ourselves as physicians? Well, some wonderful writing by John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard Funds, highlights professional values conflict in business and in medicine, where people have to weigh the value of their profession and the value of making money. The value of their profession and the value of making money. And now some other writings point out that the value of making money is being compounded by the ability to have technology measure the metrics for making money. So making money and metrics for making money can be measured very well. And you and I have to worry is if that takes over the values of our profession, then we have a real problem because the reason that patients come to us is because we had values in our profession. Now, the other aspect about physicians that I wanna highlight that began to come from our research and others is there may well be a climate of silence that we do things that may in fact sabotage our own values without telling people that what's happening to us. That we have learned over time in our education to do what we do, but to keep our heads down. That's a very strange phenomenon. John Bogle wrote that the value is not choosing between professional and business values, but balancing them that places the interest of consumers above our own interest. John Bogle recently passed away. I was so sad that he passed away before I got to write him to tell him how important his work was to us. And Lee Shulman and Howard Gardner, two powerful educators. Professions have been subjected to a whole new set of pressures of new technologies and the growing importance of making money. So you and I are an experiment, subjects in an experiment that's been going on for a while. There's 2005. Employee voice and silence, a big thing now that people are observing things happening to themselves and their profession and staying quiet. It's a risk to talk for sure, but we have been taught to stay quiet. So we decided we had to study this and so we tried to begin to talk to people. And I was moved by Abraham Verghese, one of the faculty that's now at Stanford, you know, a prolific writer. And he said, the language of science did not begin to capture the phenomenon. He was writing in my own country about HIV patients, where he said, and I'll let you read it. Well, I think you could search and replace that sentence with our field. What's the language of science? This is the language of science. Oh, 45%? Oh, 47%? Oh, 50%? Oh, only half a million died? That's the language of science and we can get inured to that language. So we decided we had to have the language of physician. We began a study funded by Stanford to interview a physician and ask them in the last two weeks, have you felt a negative emotion with the electronic health record? Here's some examples.
Well, here's a nurse whose job has changed. Her job is now to get the physician to document. And one of the nurses in Colorado told me that it severed the ties between themselves and the physician, that they become the bearer of bad news. What did the patient, what did the physician say to us when we got these interviews? I just feel so bad for my patient. I failed my patient. So we're watching our colleagues have these emotional responses and we're now studying them. Why is it so important? Richard Gunderman said, professional burnout's the sum of hundreds and thousands of tiny betrayals of purpose that no one hardly notices and kills too late. Well, we started looking at the competencies of HCGME and saying, well, what are, which competency are we working on when we do that, when we have to worry about the documentation? Well, system-based practice, which we all believe in, has taken over a real sacrifice, patient care, acquisition of knowledge, communication skills, professionalism, practice-based improvement. And I'm optimistic. Why? Because I don't think we've really attended to this as physicians. More than 60% of physicians said they do not want to seek help for depression. They didn't tell anybody else. They isolated themselves. They sometimes talked with family members and close friends. But as a profession, we haven't said, we have got to go after this. And a lot of the groups at Stanford said, yes, we do. And so now they've refunded us because now we want to study the administrators who in their hopes and their goals are not trying to punish us or their patient. But we want to find out what makes them tick because they're going through some misery as well. And we're hoping that what we learn from patients and from, from physicians rather, and from administrators will be brought together in a way that we can become more collaborative. So I want to end with a couple of quotations. Francis Peabody at Harvard in 1926 said, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now, I became very bold about 10 years ago and changed this quotation. And I now want to give it to you a new way. The secret of the care of the patients is in caring for those who care for the patients. We can no longer accept burnout or depression as the expected consequence of our profession. We have to re-examine our own efforts as teachers and learners and institutional administrators to regain this noble profession. But it's gonna require more effective caring, not only for the patient, but for each other. So I don't come to you today with a lot of perfect answers, but I think that it's time that we have to say, we can't watch our colleagues at a rate of 40 to 60% fall down among us without saying it's because we're relinquishing values in our profession. So I will stop. I left only a few minutes for questions and I apologize for that, but I hope I've provoked you to think about how we might collaborate with administrators to become more attuned to preserving the value systems that we signed up for. Okay, I will stop at this point and thank you so much. Thanks very much, Kelly. We have time for a couple of questions. I'll get to them quickly. Uh, the first is from Stu Linus, a uh, nephrologist at Denver Health. <clears throat> at Denver Health. Right. He says, uh, with Dr. Kolb's and your emphasis on the importance of reflection, I would be interested in learning your feelings about current, the current trend to reduce the length of time of medical school uh, and hours of experience. Uh, reflection requires time for thoughts to percolate. Well, I totally agree with you. I think that there, there, a practicality has taken over the idea of learning and broad-based learning. Uh, training has taken over that too. Uh, the issue of money again has come in for training. And so I think that that's pushing against us. But I think you're nailing something very important. Even in a day-to-day -day basis, I think we have compressed the amount of time for thinking. And for students to recognize the utility of the seminar in reflection versus the lecture that they watch in double speed on video uh, to be able to do the, the to get the test right has lost some of its power. So I agree with you completely and thank you so much for that question. Yeah, absolutely. Another question from Karen Chaco, one of our general internists. Yes. Uh, 
thank you. And in, uh, in Kolb's PDSA cycle, does it always start with an experience as the entry point? If that's true, then how can junior learners start early when they may not be having hands-on experiences until later on? Yeah, wonderful question. Thank you so much. Uh, the issue, he does uh, focus on the experiential learning although there are three different kinds of experiences that one may want to think about. One is actually having the experience, two is thinking about the experience, and three is watching somebody else have the experience. It's called both symbolic and vicarious and participant modeling. So the experience can be replaced by somebody else's experience if they tell you about it, but it's better if you can have the experience. So. Uh, what he would capitalize on is in the early student is to dwell on what experience they are having. And when you want to share experiences, be as explicit as you can about how your experience relates to them. Great question, Theron. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, how does experiential learning dovetail with uh, care pathways that tell you how to do things by clicking a button on the EMR and everything follows there from that. I don't wanna say they're diametrically opposed, but I would say there are so many things that we're doing in medicine today that are not based on educational principles at all. They're based on getting the job done faster. The educational principle is to master the skill faster. And most of us are focusing on how do we figure out the skill and master it faster without ever saying, and I, I tried to highlight whether the doing of that skill was so important. So we have to do it, but it's, it's not gonna, it, it doesn't take very much reflection, does it? One of my interns told me that when I recommended that he use the chronology of present illness and take a moment during his writing on the computer to intersect the term, he said, oh my God, I'm gonna actually think during my write-up. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping to do. Uh, one last question here. Uh, in this week's New Yorker, uh, mm -hmm. there's a relatively dismissive article on burnout suggesting it's a trend in society as a whole. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, is it more widespread in medicine and can we learn from any other fields that have addressed it successfully? Oh. Uh, wonderful question. I think every field is, is dealing with it now. I'm mean, one of the uh, Stanford professors in the business school had uh, just written a book called Dying for a Paycheck, in which he recounts how employees are literally getting sick and dying uh, because of their relationship with employers, etc. Now it turns out that physicians as a profession still lead the lead the race when measured for burnout. Uh, we still are in the head in, in the lead. Uh, Tate Shanafel pointed this out recently <laughs> and throughout, throughout the time. So we can learn from other fields, but everybody is trying to think about what to do about this. And the two pieces that I would highlight is so much work is being done appropriately on resilience. How can we help you get the skills to withstand what you're having to be up against? And that's to, not to be demeaned. But I'm thinking that in addition to that, we have to let people return to explicit statement of their purpose and to have the employees and employers, the administrators and the physician locked arm in arm on refulfilling the purpose. What we're hoping to do with our current research is to see whether administrators who recognize that we are betraying purposes and behaviors that actually would facilitate patient care in the process of doing the behaviors that end up uh, being for the purpose of, of uh, uh, money making, to be honest, but for the purpose of getting what's being measured, that we aren't playing a big enough role in highlighting what could and should be measured. Now, I don't come to you with answers that say, boy, we figured this out. But what I'm hoping that there's no brighter group of people than physician and no more principled group of people that I think should take this on and lead all the profession towards thinking about ways that we can return values in spades. Thank you for those questions, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. And thank you all for letting me come home. All right, Kelly, thanks very much. It was a terrific talk and I think everybody profited by having you back. Nice to see you. Nice to bye -bye. see you, thank you all, bye-bye.
Thanks, Kelly. My mark.